At Good Samaritan Catholic College, we know that clarity is powerful. It's so powerful, in fact, that you can double the amount you learn in a year just by putting some simple steps into play. So we're interested in charging up your learning achievement with learning intentions and success criteria. Your learning intention for this course is to explain to multiple peers how you make best use of learning intentions and demonstrate the skills you use to organize your notes, make your own judgment about your success, and identify what you need to do next to improve. So why does our college use learning intentions and success criteria? The learning that you do is broken into small chunks where one or two ideas or concepts are learned during a lesson or sometimes during a few lessons. And the focus of each chunk is described by what we call a learning intention. And your teachers this year will take the time to ensure you fully understand all of the words in the learning intention and they're going to clarify that everyone in the class fully understands what it is that they're going to be learning. Learning intentions really matter because they allow you to have a clear focus on the learning in each and every lesson and to really target in on what is valuable. They're the stepping stones on a pathway through all of your learning over time. Your teachers will also work with you to ensure that you're clear about success criteria so that you can measure your own achievement on the go. Success criteria will be referenced by your teachers this year. And sometimes they'll include work samples to help you judge success and to help you make decisions about what you need to do next. Learning intentions Focus you on what you are learning in every lesson. Success criteria allow you to judge your own progress while you're learning and understand what you need to do next to improve. So what are the key parts of a learning intention? All learning intentions usually have common parts that give you a guide to the key learning action that you will engage, the subject elements that you'll focus on, and the context to apply those subject elements. We call these parts the cognitive verb. This is the key action that you as the learner must engage. The subject elements. This is the chunk of subject learning that you're going to focus on. And finally, the context. The conditions you apply to the subject learning. Sometimes, though, learning intentions don't have a context, but usually they will. Let's have a look at this learning intention that's about to appear on your screen. Students work in small groups to explain how the relative positions of the Earth, Sun and Moon affect phenomena on Earth. The cognitive verb is explain. You have to think about what does it mean to explain something. And your teacher will guide you through a process of understanding all of the elements of explaining something. The subject elements are how the relative position of the earth, sun and moon. They are your subject elements. You're learning about the positions relative to one another of the earth, sun and moon. And the context is how they affect 
phenomena on Earth. You can see that learning intentions can be a little bit complex. But it's important that we can identify the parts of the learning intention. It's one thing to identify the parts, but we need it clear. And we call this clarifying a learning intention. I'm not going to lie to you today. Learning intentions usually have language that's difficult to properly understand. And at Good Sam's, teachers won't change the difficult concepts and language because it's important for you as students to learn these difficult words and difficult concepts. Teachers will engage the class in discussion every time you start new pieces of learning to make sure that the difficult parts are understood and we ask every student that to take part in this discussion. It is really, really important that you do. Clarifying focuses on finding meaning in the diffi difficult parts of the cognitive verb, the subject elements and the context. Let's have a look at that learning intention again. To explain, have a think for a moment. What does it mean to explain something? In the classroom, your teacher will get you to work with your elbow partner or one or two of your peers to come up with good words to better understand and better describe what it means to explain something. You can Google some and find things like explaining something means to clear it up, to go into detail, put it in plain language, illustrate, point out. The relative positions of the earth, sun and moon, getting to that subject element. You can ask some questions. Where the earth is in the orbit around the sun, where the moon is in its orbit around the earth and the sun. You can even have a diagram like the one shown on the screen to help you better understand what it is we're talking about. This is an interesting word here in the context, affect. What does it mean to affect? We've got to be careful with this one. Effect and affect are similar words with slightly different meanings sometimes. To affect means to influence. It can mean to change, modify or disturb. And the last part of the context, phenomena on earth. And this can mean things like the weather, gravity, time, life cycles and many, many other things. But you can see by working through the process of clarifying the learning intention, you have a better understanding of what it is you need to do, what it is that you're learning about, and the context that you're learning about it in. It's important for you as a learner to organize your learning. I'm going to say to you now, having scrappy bits of learning around the place is not going to be good enough anymore. And one of the great ways, though, to organize your learning is to organize it under your learning intentions. So because learning intentions outline a new concept in the learning, from now on, we want you to start a new page for every new learning intention. Or if you're typing, start a new document. At the top of the page, ensure that the learning intention is written or typed very clearly. Below the learning intention, you should show your clarifying notes. And then below that, then we can start adding our notes. And in another course down the line, we'll talk about effective note taking. But for now, let's have a look what we mean by organizing our learning with clarified learning intentions. So at the top of your page, we want you to clearly write or type the learning intention that the teacher is sharing with you. 
In this case, all students will describe how the characteristics of the Sunshine Coast are perceived and valued differently. As I said to you before, your teacher will go through a clarifying element with you. So I'm going to ask you to write it twice. And the second time you write it, it's the clarifying time. And it will look like this. Think to yourself, looking at that learning intention, what is the cognitive verb? What's the thing that you have to do in the learning here? If you look carefully, the word describe should jump out at you. That's what you have to do. You have to describe. And what does it mean to describe? To talk about, to detail, to outline, to express. And your teacher in your class will give you and your classmates time to unpack that. I wonder what our subject is. Well, we need to know as part of the subject, what do we mean by characteristics? There's a list of words that are similar to characteristics. What about perceived? That's a difficult word. To perceive something is to recognize, to look on, to view, to figure out, and to value, to rate, sometimes to cherish, sometimes priced, sometimes treasured. So let's take some time now in our course to practice clarifying a learning intention. Here's one from the HPE syllabus. All students will investigate the impact of changes and transitions on their own and others' identities. Remember, when we're organising our work with a learning intention, we take a new page. When we do this, if you get the chance, I'd like you to discuss with one or two of your peers what you think the learning will be focused on and what action you'll be engaged in. Let's write the learning intention at the top of a page, and I'd like you to practice doing this now. At the top of the page, we write the learning intention just as the teacher has written it on the board. Now you'll remember the second part of things beyond writing the learning intention is to clarify the learning intention. To prepare to clarify the learning intention, let's write it again. As you're writing it, I wonder if you're starting to think, what is my cognitive verb? What is it asking me to do? And I'm hoping that what's starting to jump out at you is this key word here, investigate. And we're going to investigate the impact of changes and transitions on our own and others' identities. So the cognitive verb is to investigate. The subject matter is the impact of changes and transitions. And the context is on our own and others' identities. So we can start to break down those words. And I'd like you to take some time now, when we get all these up on the screen, to pause the video, to find out a bunch of words that help us understand what it means to investigate a bunch of words to explain the impact, a bunch of words for changes, and some different words for transitions, and finally, some words for identities. So I invite you to pause the video now and find those words. Alongside learning intentions, another really important thing we do at Good Sam's is to use success criteria.
it's important for us to know what we have to do to be successful and to, to use our success criteria very, very well so that not only can we know where we're at in our learning, but know what to do next to improve. So let's imagine that our learning's been guided by a good learning intention that's been clarified. And let's imagine that we had to write a few paragraphs in a report about how changes and transitions have impacted our identity to this point. Again, we're looking at that HPE learning intention. I wonder if we had to write a few paragraphs in a report about how changes and transitions have impacted our identity, what would the teacher look for to judge the success of you and of others in your work? This is how we develop success criteria. When we get the chance to do this, we'd like you to work with your teachers and peers to create success criteria for achieving levels. We don't want you to focus too much on the writing elements in this case, but more about the element of, well, how well have we talked about how changes and transitions have impacted our identity? A not achieving area would be a student that creates a paragraph just retelling some changes they've experienced from childhood to adolescence from their own perspective. Because, well, if we were writing a report, we'd really want to get into deep detail about how changes that are happening to you now are impacting your identity, the who you are as a person. And so we could work together to come up with some levels of what are an at achievement would look like, an above achievement or a B standard would look like, and a high achievement and an A standard would look like. And I think if you think about good work and if you work with your teacher on this, you could see that there'd be different levels to how we could go about doing this. It's important for your teacher often to engage you in good discussion about the different levels of achievement and how to get there. Because if we use this effectively, success criteria become the feedback mechanism for us. They are the way the teacher gives us good, meaningful information to improve. So when your teacher works with you to make the success criteria clear, it's your responsibility to use them and your responsibility to seek feedback to improve. We call this bumping up our work. And there are different modes of feedback that we should use in our learning. And you should use both of these modes while referring to the success criteria. We can get peer feedback, feedback from those who work with us in our class on the same ideas and get their advice on what they think we have done well and what we need to do next to improve. And of course, you can get teacher feedback on how to improve also. And your teachers will take the time to conference with you on this. In both cases, you sit with either your peer or your teacher and with the success criteria. You look at the work that you've produced and collaboratively, that means together, discuss where the work sits in relation to the success criteria. Are you not achieving? Are you achieving okay? Are you achieving highly or very highly? You then collaborate again about the three things you should do next to bump up your work to the next level. You can see in this module how you can really power up your learning by making the most of learning intentions and success criteria. And we'd now like you to commit to action with your learning peers. So using the example below as a guide, we'd like you to write a message 
that you send to two of your learning peers outlining what you're going to do now when you come across new learning intentions and what you're going to do with success criteria. This is a written commitment. This is something that is so important at Good Sam's. We want you to take it really, really to heart and to commit to doing this because we know for you to improve every uh, in every way and to achieve everything you can, this is very, very important. It's so important, in fact, that we are going to test you with a Kahoot. You'll find in the pack that we've sent out, there's a link to a Kahoot with learning intentions and success criteria. And your teachers and me and Mr. Rattray and Mrs. Holmes are going to check that you've been accessing this Kahoot and that you know what we're talking about. So with that in mind, we invite you to go back over the video, listen again, take notes, and then challenge yourself in the Kahoot. Thank you for listening today. We know that you can achieve great things in your learning.